Well, thank you everyone for being here today. I'd like to um, extend a thank you for the sponsors who are supporting this event. My name is Rob Reyes. I'm a trustee of Pflugerville ISD. I'm also the chair of the Center for Public Policy and Political Studies, and we are um, thrilled to have you here and thrilled to have our panel here. Um, we're going to try to keep our program moving along because one of our esteemed panelists uh, needs to catch a flight and be out of here by 12.55, so we're going to run a tight schedule to honor that. Um, the Center uh, for Public Policy and Political Studies, for those of you who aren't familiar, provides civic opportunities for Austin Community College student engagement. We have a number of programs we offer, uh, including internships for our CPPS uh, students who are interested in working with public entities. Um, it's, my, it's my pleasure to welcome and introduce um, the president and CEO of Austin Community College, Dr. Richard Rhodes. Dr. Richard Rhodes joined ACC in the fall of 2011 after serving as president of El Paso College. He is a leader in higher education in both Texas and the nation, tirelessly working to improve systems and grow partnerships to increase student success and completion. Dr. Rhodes is a native of New Mexico and a Texan by choice and a UT alumni. He has a bachelor's of accounting and master's of arts in education management from New Mexico State University. Um, he has earned his doctorate through um, the Community College Leadership Program, as I mentioned, at UT. At this point, he normally says hook him, but maybe he's not too thrilled with UT today. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome and introduce Dr. Rhodes. Well, good afternoon. How's everybody doing? First of all, I want to to recognize uh, elected officials and uh, members of the Board of Trustees from Austin Community College. And so with us from Austin Community College today, we've got uh, Mark Williams, who is the Vice Chair of the Board of Trustees. <laughs> Julianne Nitch, Board of Trustee member. Nicole Eversman, Board of Trustee member. And Nicole is going to graduate from the University of Texas at Austin a week from Friday. So hook them. And also with, with us, we've got uh, Bruce Elfont, who is a tax assessor collector. <laughs> Susanna Woody, uh, Del Valle. I, I still say Del Valle, but it's Del Valley here, uh, ISD. Uh, Former Senator Gonzalo Barrientos. Jim Coronado, former district judge. Sam Samaripa, Mainer ISD trustee. Lee Cook, former Austin mayor. Annette Villarot. Uh, Deputy Superintendent from Del Valley. Tom Glenn, former Superintendent of Leander. And you're going to meet our panelists uh, very shortly. Uh, but now I'd like to introduce to you uh, somebody who's very important at ACC, and that happens to be the, the president of our Student Government Association. Uh, this young man. Uh, has done an incredible job as the, as the president of, of the Student Government Association during this past year. He's been a, a real pleasure to work with. But let me tell you just a little bit about him, what he's done during this past year. He is, uh, as of this Friday night, he'll be receiving a double major degree in business administration and also paralegal studies from Austin Community College. 
But at the same time that he's been taking courses at Austin Community College, he's been taking courses at Texas State University working towards a bachelor's degree in business administration. Uh, so he has been, I dare say, he has been quite busy, but a very successful, great example of what uh, the type of student that we have at Austin Community College. And so please join me in welcoming Emmanuel Cuevas. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is, hi everyone, my name is Emmanuel Cuevas and I am the president of Austin Community College Student Government Association. And I would like to welcome you to this leadership gathering hosted by the Center for Public Policy and, and Public Studies. This is the 11th annual CPPS fundraiser where we acknowledge the hard, all the hard work that everyone at the center has done. Throughout this year and previous years, Student Government Association has worked alongside and has been uh, advised by the CPPS to improve ACC, Austin, and the surrounding communities as a whole. Events that include, but are not limited to, the uh, Brown Santa Book Drive. Uh, the Brown Santa Book Drive, where we collected over 4,600 books uh, to give to children to inspire the love of learning on young minds. We, al we also provided some of the books and some of the board games to the Sheriff's Department, so whenever they, uh, families of inmates visit their loved ones, they are able to spend quality time together. Uh, the 16 de Septiembre event, where, where uh, the center acknowledges Texas' rich, rich and diverse history. The Constitution Day and uh, Constitution Debate Day and the Constitution uh, Signing Day, where the center teaches students how, how <clears throat> uh, about their rights and how government works. The Texas Hispanic Politics and the Texas Independence Diversity Day, where the center encourages students to be active members in their community. The center doesn't only talk, only, only talk the talk, they also walk the walk. Last year, they asked student government members what they, they can do to, to, to get more students involved and better serve the student body at ACC. We told them that a lot, a lot of students would love to be more involved, however, Sometimes we have to choose between, between being involved and being able to pay for rent and food. So they made it into, into a part of their policy to pay students for their work done at the, at the center. They also made sure that most of the internships offered at the center are paid or have a, some sort of stipend associated with, with the internships. So thank you for listening to us and setting up an example for other organizations. Um, I would also like to to thank the, uh, the ACC's External Affairs Department because with their help we were able to visit our U.S. and state congressmen and represent, uh, representatives to lobby for more higher education funding and other issues facing us students today. Because of SGA, the CPPS, and the External Affairs Department, this year I was able to learn a lot about myself, uh, how to be a leader and how to, be, how to lead others. However, this year would not be possible with, without uh, the following people. Um, my vice president, who is in here today, but uh, he was a, Mr. Adrian Fierro, Fierro uh, that, was able to step, that was able to step up whenever I was not able to fulfill my duties as president. The secretary, Luis Quijano, for keeping track of our association's records and, and knowing procedure better than I do. Ms. Ms. The Senate Chair, Ms. Ms. McCall Kavanaugh, who led our recruitment efforts and made, a, made sure that all SGA members and all ACC students heard, uh, made sure that the administration heard all of our issues and we represented every, everyone and every student in all ACC campuses. Director of Communications, Ms. Lauren Wallace, who isn't here right now either, but she, she is responsible for all our social media feed this year. Our, tre our treasurer, Ma Maria Trevenio and Ryan Wharton, who kept, our who kept track of re our resources and make sure that our events, our events are fully funded. Parliamentarian Mr. Manters Oseni, who keeps, keeping, who, who keeps order in our meetings, and our historian and 2019-2020 president, president uh, Mr. Noble Udo, one of the most wide-eyed and most mo motivated students that I have ever met. I cannot forget about Mr. Mohammed Al Ghul, 
for his advice, his guidance, and for sending, all, sending out a whole bunch of recommendation letters. Thank you. Uh, but lastly, I would like to thank one very special person. This person has been a mentor to me and many other current and former members of SGA. This person has always, ha, is always willing to, to give students advice and willing to, um, willing to go beyond his duty uh, to see students succeed. Without, hi, without him, SGA will still just be considered another club at ACC. When I told this person that I was applying to be Lloyd Doggett's field rep, he immediately called up his office and told them that they would be crazy not to hire me. A week later, I was, I was actually being, I was being interviewed by Lloyd Doggett's um, chief of staff in Washington, D.C. I didn't get the job, however, uh, I didn't get the job, and that's because like, like all millennials, I am overly committed. But this, this just shows how far he's willing to go for all students. So please join me in giving my mentor and director of the Center for Public Policy and Political Studies, Mr. Peg Young, a standing ovation. Thank you. And I would like to, uh, I would like to introduce Ms. Malcolm over to our stage. Is that correct? Yes. Who's? I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. I would like to introduce uh, VP of Operations, Ms. Malcolm. Good afternoon, everybody, and we're going to keep this moving right along so that we get to hear a lot from our panel. But it's my great pleasure to introduce our panel moderator for today, and that would be Texas Tribune CEO and co-founder Evan Smith. I'm particularly proud to get to do this, as Evan is a longtime personal friend, and also because ACC is incredibly proud to support and sponsor the Trib Fest and the Texas Tribune in its countless valuable newsmaker events hosted in every corner of the state, including at least three events that have been hosted in the last two years on ACC campuses. And I also like to brag, ACC was the very first community college in the state of Texas where one of the Tribune events was uh, produced. The Texas Tribune is an institution of civic literacy and balanced public affairs journalism because of Evan's vision. It provides a level of in-depth coverage that we don't see much anymore in this modern media landscape. So when I think about Evan though, I think about the fact that he could be described as the Forrest Gump of Austin. Now, y'all think about that a minute, and he's got his head dug down. And here's why I say that, though. He knows and has probably interviewed every historical figure there is in the last 25 years. But, of course, we would have to call him the genius uh, level Forrest. Because Forrest would often say, you know, my mama says, stupid is as stupid does. And I would change that for Evan to say, genius is as genius does, because Evan does genius for all of us. After he earned a master's degree in journalism at Northwestern, he learned Texas journalism and Texas politics at the Texas Monthly for over 17 years. Then he was smart enough and genius enough to see the handwriting on the wall of print journalism and invented the concept of truly independent news by creating the Texas Tribune. He uses his vast array of contacts that used to be called a Rolodex, now it's a it's vast array of contacts, and he uses it to recruit famous and infamous guests for his nationally televised PBS show, Overheard with Evan Smith, and we're so excited that that will be moving to our ACC campus when KLRU gets out there. And when it comes to interviewing and asking the perfect questions, nobody does it better than Evan Smith. Please join me in welcoming Evan Smith. Hi, everybody. You hear this okay? Thank you so much for being here. Our guests uh, for our panel are going to join me on stage here. 
Let me say, first of all, Dr. Rhodes and everybody associated with ACC, how pleased I am to have an opportunity to take part in this to support the college. I understand, as all of you understand, that more than 50% of the enrollment in higher ed in Texas is in community colleges. These are the true public squares of all of our communities in Texas. If you support higher ed, if you care about the future of Texas, you care about community college. And if you're in Austin, you care about Austin Community College, which is the very jewel in the crown among all community colleges in the state. So thank you very much, Dr. Rhodes and Ms. Malcolm and everybody else for being here. It is now my pleasure to introduce our guests. We're going to have a great conversation about the most important issue of this political and public policy year, school finance reform. And I'm so pleased to introduce three of the 13 public servants appointed to the, in 2017 to serve on the Texas Commission on Public School Finance which met during the legislative interim and produced a detailed report full of recommendations that drove the discussion about school finance reform during the 2019 session. We have a few weeks left. There's still a lot of work to be done, but we're getting close to the end, and we think we know what's going to happen, and we're going to talk about that with our guests. <laughs> On my left uh, is Nicole Conley Johnson. She has been Chief Financial Officer of the Austin Independent School District since 2009. She has more than 15 years of financial management experience in urban public school districts, including New York City and Washington, D.C. Ms. Conley Johnson was appointed to the commission by then Speaker Joe Strauss. She's a native of Kansas. She has an undergraduate degree from the University of Colorado and a master's degree from the New School. Doug Killian, next to uh, Nicole, is the superintendent of the Pflugerville Independent School District. He previously served as the superintendent of the Hutto, Poteet, and Huffman Independent School Districts. He was appointed to the School Finance Commission by Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick. He was born in Arkansas, though he says he's an Army brat. Really, he moved Air all Force, over. Air Force. Air, Air Force brat, moved all over. He has an undergraduate degree himself from Southwest Texas State University, the old Southwest Texas State, a master's degree from the Texas A&M International University in Laredo, and a doctorate from... Texas A&M University. Finally, Kevin Ellis, Where's Republican. The wolf? So, the wolf? There's, there's no, no wolf. whoops in the room. I'm sorry. Uh, I can't Austin, do anything yeah. about that. <laughs> All right. Turn the wrong Finally, side. Kevin Ellis, Republican of Lufkin, was elected to represent District 9 on the State Board of Education in 2016. He previously spent four years on the Lufkin Independent School District Board, including a year as its president. He was appointed to the School Finance Commission by the chair of the State Board, Donna Bohorich. Born in Texas City, Dr. Ellis has degrees from Western Washington University and Texas Chiropractic College. Please welcome our distinguished guests. Give them a big hand. So I don't want to spend, you three, I don't want to spend too much time in the past because we're really right now in the middle of the action on school finance. But you did serve on this commission, and there was a problem that the state decided we needed to solve. Mr. Ellis, define the problem. When you were appointed to this commission in 2017, the 13 of you, we had already studied school finance a lot. We've been studying it for decades. What was the purpose of doing this again in a formal sense? Well, as everyone remembers, back in the 85th legislative session, it all kind of came to a head. And when House Bill 21 did not go through, the compromise that they had was the School Finance Commission. Right. And that's what led to this year of study. So there are a couple of key points that I think led to this. You will hear a lot that you can't fix school finance without fixing property taxes. And that's, there's a lot of people, and I think most people in this room are very worried about our school finance system and how it's working, but there's more people that are worried about their property taxes. I think the, 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 when those two came together was what got most people's uh, attention. I think one of the second things that really led us to where we were were the outdated formulas. We're dealing with formulas from 20, 25 years ago. For example, we have a cost of education index um, that was set up back when Frisco had one stoplight. We have transportation funding that's set up when, when diesel was 57 cents a gallon. So there's some very outdated formulas that led to where we're at. And then the other issue, and I'm speaking to the epicenter right here, is just recapture. Um, right. Recapture got out of control, and that was the other issue I think led to this, this right. wave. Nicole, you understand the recapture problem from inside the Austin Independent School District. We heard a lot for years about how Houston had a recapture problem. Austin's recapture problem has been significantly worse, has it not, than, than Houston? Significantly worse. Define that problem, please. Well, I mean, in the next five years, we'd be scheduled to spend $3.3 billion to the state. 
Um, Austin represents 25% of all the collections in the state of Texas, and the te state of Texas collects about $3.7 billion in recapture dollars. And so right now, this year for the first time, we'll actually send more money to the state than we get to keep to run the district operations with our m and tax. And so as I deal with taxpayers, probably more direct, Austin taxpayers more directly than most of our legislatures, we've been sort of ringing the bell about this issue that's been growing. When I look back just just around in two, 2014, the portion of the recapture, and, and I'm going to call it what it is, a state tax, right? This is the state apportionment under, uh, the, under the recapture system was just all over $350. It's grown to almost $1,700 of the tax bill of the average taxable home, average taxpayer here in Austin. And so you've seen recapture balloon like 175% right. in the next five years. And so we're going to be sending billions of dollars to the state, one city, one locality. At the same time, where we're struggling with a budget deficit of $65 million. we're closing schools, programs that we know are important to our communities are at risk of not being satisfied and funded. And so the fact that you're paying record property tax values, double digits, but see no localized benefits to it, it just culminated into this um, necessity to really look at and pay attention to why the state's reliance on recapture as a method of finance for the state was really putting just this unfair burden on local property taxpayers. Yes. Even TEA said the burden for local property taxpayers grew to almost 51 percent, right? And so you're, you're paying the bigger share yeah. of the bill. S Superintendent, you know, so much of, of the school finance conversation is about m money. I mean, it has right. the word finance in it, right? And so much of what we think we need to do for the public education system has to do with money. Money's not the only answer. Right. right. Do you feel as a superintendent that more money would be good? Are you willing to say that as far as it goes flat? You know, in general, yeah. 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 Um, in general, I'd say yes. I mean, um, obviously, there are so folks in the audience that would say that efficiency is part of that, that equation as well. Right. Um, and I would say the same thing, but I don't think that we judge our entire public school system by a few bad actors that may not be doing efficient operations and all that. It right. really is, I think, over the last 30 years, the system has just gotten out of whack. It's you, exactly like Dr. Ellis has described. Do you think there's a correlation between spending per student and performance in the classroom? Absolutely. I think one of the things that um, I've noticed, at least in our conversations during the Finance Commission, was the, the increased cost for some of our special needs kids. And I'm using that in the broadest sense of the word, not just special education. I'm talking about career in tech. I'm talking about our economically disadvantaged kiddos, um, our bilingual um, students, um, all of those things. I think that's probably one of the things that was probably missing from the Finance Commission, a little bit more data along the lines of what it costs to educate a kid in a special program. Right. Nicole, the, the, the numbers I've seen have the state average spending per student at about 2000 or a little bit more below the national average yes. spent per student. Uh, we have 5.4 million, a little bit more than 5.4 million kids enrolled in the Texas public schools, adding 82,000 kids to the system a year. But in a fast-growing city like Austin, you're having to keep up not only with the investments that you need to make to do better, you have to just keep up with growth, yeah. right? Which we have been able to do because the funding formula elements are 30 years old. Right. There's no built-in adjusting inflationary factors. So school districts across the state have had to absorb uh, almost 7% in inflation over the last right. 10 years. And so um, you can't be expected, you know, expectations are rising, but the monies and the resources that you have to meet those expectations are actually being cut because you're absorbing the higher cost of doing business, but the funding formula doesn't account for that. And I would also add that, you know, Texas, we have such great prowess about our economic um, posture and standing, um, but it's really starting to sort of take a toll on what we're gonna be able to do as a great state. Um, we, Texas, scored a D minus in funding and, and got an F in per people funding. And so when you look at things nationally, while we, you know, there could be some debate about does money matter, yes, money matters, right? But it has to be well spent. We mm. all know that. Right. But we know that the highest performing states, if you look at like Massachusetts, they, they spend like, you know, twice as much as, as Texas does. I mean, I hate to say it, but you get what you pay for in some regards, which is why right. school districts are struggling and cutting programming and 
can't really offer everything that we need to in order to make sure our students are successful. Now, Mr. Ellis, Nicole is the CFO of a, of a fast-growing urban school district. You come from Lufkin. You're kind of at the other end of the spectrum in terms of trying to think about what the more than 1,000 school districts in the state need. Not every school district is the same. In fact, arguably, there's no one-size-fits-all, right? right? Everyone needs something different. In rural Texas, is the conversation about access to funding the same as it might be in a place like Austin? Yeah, it absolutely is. And I think one of the, the, the telltale signs of that is when you look at the biggest part of our budget is, is our salaries. Right. And what we're paying our teachers. And what we fight in rural East Texas is that our teachers are leaving the rural area and going to the, the urban areas. And, and so that's the telltale sign right Because there. the urban districts can afford to pay them more. They're paying them more. And it's as complicated and as simple as that. Our quality teachers who have been there, and they're in their last couple of years, right. and they're working on their last couple of years for retirement, they'll leave and go to Houston or up to, mm -hmm. to Dallas um, where they can make five or seven or $8,000 more per year. So that, right. that's what we fight right. is mm -hmm. that type of problem. So let's talk about that. So when it came time for the legislature to come back into session, Governor made a state of the state speech, the speaker in the case of the House, Lieutenant Governor, in the case of the Senate, gave their marching orders to the members. Deal with this issue, fix this issue, focus on this issue, often at the exclusion of other issues. One of the very first topics of conversation we heard uh, uh, was teacher pay. To your very point, right. we have to address the issue of the base pay of teachers and we have to address the overall compensation of teachers. The Senate chose to go at this, as you know, Mr. Ellis, by passing a $5,000 across the board pay increase for every teacher. The theory is every teacher, right? Good teachers, middling teachers, and bad teachers. Everyone's gonna get a pay increase. Is that a good answer to the problem you've identified? Right, and you forgot to ask me, why am I against teachers if I'm not for the $5,000? Well, I, I, <laughs> I will get there. When you tell one. me you're opposed <laughs> to this, I will ask you why you hate teachers. Gotta but let's do, this in, let's do this in the order that I choose to do it in. So you go ahead. Got, got to work yeah. my setup there yeah. with that. So, yeah. so there is a, a, a huge amount of money that looks like it's going to be put back into public education. Right. There is enough for a very, very, very significant pay rates for every teacher. Right. So what the commission did is looked at, let's make the basic allotment increase. Let's give the districts the ability to do that. The $5,000 pay raise was not part of the commission findings. You had a whole lot of recommendations, but a $5,000 across the board, board pay increase was not one of was them. Was not one of them. Right. So my point, and especially this is from my viewpoint as a former school board member, let's let, you just talked about how different every district is. Right. Let's talk about how each district can find the right way to, to, to pay their teachers, and that may be different than what, when, what Lufkin needs or Pflugerville or Austin So give, needs. Mr. Killian, so give the communities, the districts each, a certain amount of money and let them decide how to spend it. That's what Mr. Ellis will say. Right. You believe that? Yeah, I believe in local control. Yeah. I'm a conservative. <laughs> don't, don't get me started on this subject. <laughs> I knew I was. We, we'll be here for like a week. Um, yeah. So you believe that the best, the best way to spend those dollars would be and should be determined by each district? Right, with the locally elected folks closest to the problem. Um, right. You know, in Pflugerville, we've been having a hard time recruiting uh, health science teachers. Specific so, types of teachers. Right, right. And, and so I even said this during the Finance Commission, some of the, it's not just about paying teachers who are performing in the classroom, more merit pay, that kind of stuff, or um, even paying teachers to go to high need schools and all that. Right. It's also about the fact that there's uh, less than 3% unemployment in this state. Um, that's incredible. That's basically full employment. So it's be becoming very hard as an educator and an administrator to recruit teachers into the, the Just profession. to find, find a qualified labor force to fill right. those positions. And so I do yeah. get, I will say that I do get right. the Lieutenant Governor's push for $5,000 across the board because you have seen teacher pay decline over the last decade. But you don't it think this is has. the correct solution to the correct problem? Not I would say that I wouldn't have a problem with 5000 plus more. Yeah, that's exactly. But just not, but not that alone. Right. Right. Your point of view on this, Ms. Colleen Johnson, what do you say? I, I think school, I, I agree with Doug that the school districts need a flexibility to apply their resources in the way that they deem most appropriate. While we love our teachers, they're the core of what we do. 
I know that another half of the employees that we have are to make sure that our students get access to the classroom. They're driving buses, they're food service workers, right. they're custodians, the counselors are being asked to do more and more. And so we'd like to be, have the flexibility to address other needs across the district. Right. And, uh, you know, the teachers are not the well, only Well, the legislation important. has been widened to include more non-instructional staff, but maybe not everybody. Well, right? librarians, but right. not the counselors, not the food service workers, not the bus drivers. nurses. I right. mean, every, yeah. it takes a village. So you all would have given a raise across the board to everybody, not just teachers. We right. would like the opportunity yeah. to consider, yeah. I'd say. Right. Mr. Ellis, you know, uh, Mr. Kelly had mentioned merit pay. There was a call out at the beginning uh, uh, to pay um, high performing teachers more, right. right? Pay for performance. This is not a new idea. But, it, but in particular, examples around the state where these kinds of programs have been put into place successfully were held up as examples of what the state might do in total. That was in your recommendation, some kind to pay for performance, but it got into the legislature and then that part of the plan disappeared. What happened? It's, it's a fluid process. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, uh, and actually it's part back in, in the latest Senate version that's now back in the conference committee. Right, but the House right. version, the House version right. that went into right. conference did not have pay for performance so, in it. So the, the, the program you're talking about is really two parts. It's identifying your best teachers. And I remember Dr. Killian made a comment during the school finance commission that he would give his left arm to know who his best teachers are. Right. That's a very, that's a very challenging prospect to be able to know that. So yes, we want to pay our best teachers more, but the other part of the program that was brought in, this is a Dallas ISD ACE model is to, to identify your best teachers, but make sure that those teachers get in front of your neediest students. Right. So, so superintendent Hinojosa, Dr. Killian's colleague in Dallas, mm -hmm who was kind of held up during this whole discussion like the baby in the Lion King, right? right. He was, you know, he, he, here's the one. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Hinojosa was, uh, was praised for a program in which he took his highest performing teachers and put him in his most challenging schools and in a pretty short period of time turned those around, right. did he not? So I think what we came out of the School Finance Commission is, and, and to our point again back to the rural issues, is I've got neighboring districts who only have one campus. Right. So they can't move their best teachers to their most neatest campus when there's only one. Only one. So what we came to is a point that we've got to have this local discretion. Let the local districts decide who their best teachers are and how they can best get them in front of their kids who need it the most, whether it's moving to another campus or moving right. to a different mm -hmm. classroom or something along those lines. Yeah, so Dr. Killian, you don't know who your best teachers are? It's a lot more difficult than you would think. I mean, there are a lot of things that go into um, looking at performance, and how exactly do you measure that in the arts? Um, we don't have a test for that, and right. I'm not advocating for a test for the arts, right. by the way, either. <laughs> We've got plenty. Um, but yeah, it's, it's difficult. And then the whole philosophical question about the assessment, the state assessment, um, does it measure what we want to measure? So if you're going to pay for performance, how do you define performance and what is the assessment that you would use to determine right. that performance? I mean, uh, the governor has a 60 by 30 um, proposal. Um, that's, that's the stretch goal for the, dis uh, for the state. Um, I think we should align everything to that. If that's really the vision for the state of Texas, right. then we should do something that, and we should have everything aligned to that goal. Right. Ms. Johnson, uh, if I said to you or said to Superintendent Cruz in Austin, tell me who your highest performers are, could you do it? I mean, obviously, it's, it's subjective to some degree, right. but right. could you do it? We, we probably, well, it depends on, upon, the, like Doug said, the lens of the data that you're looking right. at. Um, but I think through a combination of different um, data that we collect, we could probably come up with a handful of folks that we think could be successful in a potential classroom. Now, we've tried this before in Austin, right? We've taken our best teachers, the ones that are, you know, kids with the highest ranked scores according to STARS and looking at other sort of culture climate tests and put them on struggling campuses and they didn't necessarily bode well. And, and it's because you're, you're looking, you have to look for certain talents and abilities in order to move the needle. It's yeah. one thing to teach, like I always said this class, Mickey Mouse could teach this class and these kids could be okay. I could teach and they'll be fine. Right. But to move kids and increase, accelerate achievement when they have large learning gaps that's a whole different skill set. And I think that what Dallas is doing is not only are they taking high performing teachers, but they're growing, you know, they're giving them professional development, they're providing them with a lot of access to resources, they're extending the learning time. So they're applying a lot of different treatments to really get to that, to that result. 
Um, I do think that we need highly competent teachers and they need to be well paid. I'm all about the six-figure teacher. If they're able to move kids and if they're able to really demonstrate proficiencies. However, I know that it's not gonna work for every district. Um, Dallas lost that superintendent because he, he put in that performance pay system and politically, the political wins were so difficult and challenging that he had to move on and Michael Hinojosa came to sort of implement and, and, and now they're seeing these results. I think in Austin, you know, it's very difficult to overcome um, the discussions with our labor organizations right. and teachers who don't really want to step into the water of performance pay, which is why I got out of the House bill. Yeah, right. but you know, Ms. Mr. Ellis, the fact is we always want accountability in some fashion. We always right. want funding based on outcomes. What's wrong with paying for outcomes? I mean, that, that, th this seems elemental to me. You don't run a business any differently than you run a school district. You pay your best performers the most. You pay for performance. Right. And I think honestly that's what brought a lot of people to this table. You know, the, the question has been asked a lot, why, why have the stars aligned this session other? You know, how did we get to a 13-0 unanimous vote? How did the big three show up the first yeah. day of the legislature all together? And there's people that have been brought to the table that haven't been to the table before. And some of those that, are, that came to the table are the ones who are looking for this type of, of yeah. outcome measurement. But like Dr. Killian said also, it's how are we measuring that? And, and even Commissioner Marath has talked about the STAR test. Even if the STAR test is functionally sound, but it doesn't have the confidence of the education community, we still have a problem. Let me ask you straight away, is the STAR test functionally sound? The STAR test needs, there's areas of improvement it needs to have. We've got the difference of the Lexile reading levels. We've got, <clears throat> you know, what exactly is being tested. So, so many of the conversations we get to, well, what other methods are out there? You know, can we use the SAT or the ACT or the ICIP or the MAP, which are different types of assessments that they have. And they're going to have their own problems also, they're, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. just name a new right. test so that we can go curse at that test with it. Right. And the idea <laughs> is that even the STAR test is our test. And what I mean by that, it covers our standards. Those other tests don't teach or don't don't test to the Texas standards. Are the sta so, okay, points. so standards is the purview of the SBOE, Correct. right? Are the standards the right standards? The standards are, are good, and, and I'm, I'm biased, of course. You stand behind the standards, but you think that the mechanism for determining whether we're meeting those standards could be tweaked. The, uh, yes, the way the assessment, I would say, maybe a little stronger than tweaked to make sure that we're. we're but you would not assessment. throw the star test out right now, as some would. Because you're going to you're going to have to replace it with something else. With something, uh, Dr. Killian, would you yeah. get rid of the star test if you could? No, no, and we need to stick with it for a while too. I think that's part of our problem. The last couple of uh, iterations of accountability, we haven't stuck with it long enough to. Right. I mean, because we'll rise to the occasion. This is Texas, after all. We'll get there. It's just we need to have time to get there. I think that's been um, my biggest complaint about the last few accountability pieces. Ms. Johnson, no one likes the STAR test. Why not just get rid of it? Well, I, I think it's efficient for the state to have, the, it's a tool for the state to efficiently measure what they're spending money on and, and student progress. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm torn. I'm 50-50 on whether STAR should be the mechanism or not, right? I understand the need to really um, challenge ourselves so that we can serve all kids and really monitor those efforts. But at the same time, I know that there's a whole, it, is it designed structurally to do what's intended, which means that there's going to be populations of kids who are not great test takers, who will never do well on STAR. And I worry about the psychological impacts of that, or I worry about bias, inherent bias in the STAR test itself. Will some kids always do better? Is this a way to sort of siphon right. off the bad ones? And so I'm really torn in that regard, but I do know that I don't believe that the money should be tied to the outcomes of the performance of students, to kiddos showing up day one in school, and their money and their availability of programming is tied to how well the kid did before them. And yet you did call for, in the School Finance Commission report, some funding tied to outcomes, did you not? Yes, we all did, yeah. You did. Yep. So you we all, did. and you all signed the report, not under duress. Not under duress. So if you don't like that kind of funding tied to outcomes, what kind of funding tied to outcomes do you like? I like funding tied to student characteristics and needs. I like the fact that, and so this, we had to sort of balance out all the different needs. Do I like everything that was in the commission report? No. I'm, there are things and elements in that commission report I'm still fighting to this minute to get out of any consideration in the session. And, um, but I do know that you have to find the balance of needs and, and balance out interest. And there was a real interest to have a performance component yeah. to it. 
and I was interested in increasing the basic allotment and finally getting transportation funds for Austin, who didn't get it as a Chapter 41. Um, so it was just, you know, coalescing all the different interests and needs. Um, and so, I, I, yes, we, we all agree that that was a uniform report, but I can't say that every element of the report is something right. that I would strongly defend. I'm worried, I worry because we have to serve kids every day, no matter what. Whether we have the monies or not, they're legally entitled to, the, to an education that we have to provide. And so if the money is tied to the outcomes to the kids who need it the most, right? You're saying no to programming yeah. the kids who need it the most because the outcomes or the performance isn't as high as what, what was called for. And so that's where I'm turn, torn about the money piece. Dr. Killian, as an advocate for local control, you said it. Mm -hmm. Why is it better for school districts to determine how money should be spent? but not better for school districts to individually determine what qualifies as performance. Why is there one size fits all for outcomes and not one size fits all for funding? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let me just say this is um, I came to the state in 79 when my dad retired from the Air Force. Um, I would say that the state's public education performance was not where it needed to be. So I'm, I actually am a strong believer in accountability. Right. So I do think the state has a role in setting the bar. Um, but then they also have to provide the funds to get there. Yeah. Um, so so I, I do believe that that's part of the issue in this state is the balance between um, enough accountability to uh, hold us accountable for our results, but then enough local control to be able to reach whatever that bar is. Right. Mr. Ellis, one thing that's interesting to me about this whole process, coming from the School Finance Commission, rolling forward from the School Finance Commission report into the session, is now all of a sudden overnight, everybody is for pre-K. And in the last couple of let's safe sessions, pre-K was a hot potato. Pre-K was called godless socialism by mm. some people who opposed it. We had state legislators say, what you're doing in pre-K is ripping the hand, ripping uh, kids out of the, the hands of their parents and forcing them to, to uh, go into this program as opposed to assuming that parents know what's better for their kids. All of a sudden, overnight, now, everybody seems to be for pre-K. What happened? You know, I had a conversation with a gentleman in the back of the room just earlier reminiscing about my election. I had my opponent who talked that the reason that we had pre-K is to teach our children a homosexual agenda. So right. there's that mm -hmm. thought process that, that was out there. And if you have that thought process or if that's where you're coming from, then it's a non-starter to even have a discussion. I think right. when we got to the root of the matter, is pre-K an educational tool that's effective? It's, it's clear that it is. And we look at, and it's not just outcomes that last for a year or two, it's outcomes that last all the way through. So let me tie this back in to talk about the, the third grade funding. You know, we, we talked about the test that needs to be there, but the, what you have to do first before you can tie funding to a performance that happens in third grade, you've got to provide an adequate enough right. funding for districts to get them there. Now, here's, here's the funny part of that. If you go Google search our, our bill for pre-K, it's not in there. It's early childhood allotment because there's still some of these types of issues that we're dealing with. The funds are there, but it gives um, districts a control to do pre-K. The money's there for that, or whether it's other types of, of tutoring or so forth. So, so, Dr. Killian, what's likely to pass the legislature is a means for districts to provide early childhood education. Right. But it is not a requirement that pre-K be made available to every kid in the state at a certain age, at a certain funding amount. Correct, and I'm disappointed by that. Um, I think we should have came out in our final um, commission report saying pre-K was something that we needed to fund. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that was the most clear during our presentations and the data that we looked at was exactly what Dr. Ellis was talking about, that pre-K, um, inclusion in pre-K, especially for economically disadvantaged kids, it lasts. It, it even improves post-secondary readiness. The commissioner of education showed us that data. Yeah. And the, the very yeah. and the inverse, Ms. Johnson, the inverse is also true. If you don't get these kids ready to go by that third grade point, it's almost as if, almost as if they're lost. You, I've heard the president of the Dallas Federal Reserve Bank, Rob Kaplan, say that if you want to understand what we need to do for the future workforce of this state, the most important thing you can do is invest in pre-K. Right. That it goes all the way back there because if you don't get them prepared in that pre-K to three uh, mark, then they're not going to be situated to be the future workforce of the state. Right, and then, and then it becomes more costly to provide them with the remediation support 
to make it through those later, latter grades, which right. most of them really don't even begin to sort of, you, they don't rebound if they're not reading by third grade, by and large. I right. mean, we're still trying, but we all know that secondary is much more costly to provide those inputs and those interventions right. than in the earlier mm -hmm. grades. We haven't done it, I don't think, in the state of Texas because the funding formula has been designed to really put resources on at the high school level. So you see a lot of the early college, right. the career launches. We had the, the high school allotment that was supposed to sort of improve graduation right. results. But you didn't really see any, any specialized treatment for early education. And so I, I'm really extremely supportive of those early investments because we hadn't been doing so. And it, because it was structurally designed to support right. things on the latter end. And, and now, it not, it's not only pre-K, right? And I, I see this in Austin. Austin's been a great district. We've held on to pre-K as long as we could. Even when we got the massive cuts back in 2011, we had lost like 60 million in funding all in one year, but we still held on to pre-K because we knew it was worth the investment. But what you start to see is that kids do pre-K, but then in K one and two, right, we start to move our highest performing teachers out of those grades into the testing grades. And so now, with some flexibility in the monies, we can build those supports in K-1-2 so that we can sustain those results and the investment of pre-K all into the third grade. We've never had that funding flexibility to do that, and that's what we're doing in Austin, really beefing up our grade K-1 right. and 2 to sustain those investments. And so I'm happy yeah. to have some variation in that. It would have been nice to just squarely fund pre-K and, and resolve the debate. Right. Um, but I think that there's enough there to really talk about investing in pre-K and then sustaining pre-K results all the way to third grade. So we're down just to a couple of minutes left. Let me ask each of you, if you assume that some version of the House and Senate legislation that is now in conference, they come together, they agree on what they can agree on, and it, it happens. It'll be a significant accomplishment that they will have put $9 billion into public school funding, some of that into the buy down of the property taxes, but still a significant investment. But as we said at the beginning, it's only some of the work that needs to get done. You're not going to fix this overnight. Right. What will be the most important priority heading into the interim and into the next session, each of you, as we end, to focus on once we do this big swing at the bowl? Yeah, you know, in, I think you alluded to earlier about how complicated this is, and, and you can't really do this in one session. Right. We've done a lot mm -hmm. in one session, more right. than I ever thought that we could do. Sure. But you're right, there's still more. Number one, in the commission, we, you know, we didn't even really touch special ed. You know, the, right. the, there's a court case going on. Right. The agency has come in with a different system and approach to it. So we decided to just let that work its way through the system. So I think special ed is going to need. Now, they have added a little bit into the bill, yep. but it not, not to the full extent. And the other area that we really didn't touch is charter schools. And, mm -hmm. and with the issue of that, it's just a whole other area that we didn't have the capacity to, to, to spend time on. And every little lever you turn in what we did and what the legislature is doing now ripples through how charter schools are funded. So I think right. once the dust settles on what happens right now, then I think next time around we've got to look and see how Mr. Killian, are. what would you say we need to pick up the string on after the session? You know, we didn't really spend a lot of time on revenue. Um, it was right at the end. And um, if we're going to continue to fund some of these things, revenue is going to have to be looked at in the state. Well, if really you commit hard. to $9 billion this next two-year budget, you're in imply, the implication is that you're committing to it over time. Right. But, I mean, It'd be nice do, to know that the revenue really was flying, available. Right? And I would argue, are we really flying $9 billion of new money to public schools? Are we really? Because really, we're moving around the deck chairs on some of the funding formulas for right. about $3 billion of that. $3 billion is actually new money. Yeah. And then the other $3 billion is for property tax relief. So which has been a long time coming. I agree we should have had it, but the real reason why uh, it's, it's the finance system's been broken is because the state has had no right. long-term commitment to keep up their side of the funding. Um, they're less than 50% of the funding now. Right. And what is it, down to 32% or something? Well, and now? it may go up to 40% so, or thereabouts with this, with this plan. Uh -huh. but, and then Ms. Johnson, what would you say the big thing, the, pick, the big takeaway will be going forward? Um, I would, you know, I'd still love to see a cost of education study and mm -hmm. really adjusting for the CEIs. Um, the CEI got repealed in this proposal, throwing it out just because it wasn't updated. It didn't keep up with the, the current context of all the cities and right. urbans and how they've changed. But we still don't know what the North Star is. I mean, we've set a goal, you know, but we don't know what it costs to get there. What does it take for every student to reach that North Star? We didn't really go through a deep analysis of what does it really cost for every student typified by their 
need to, to really get to that North Star because it, 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 it's differentiated. Right. The costs are very different. And uh, without having that, without having that goal, I worry. I worry that, that, that we feel like, well, this is a, a, a great, significant first step in terms of curing the, the funding formulas and putting, infusing more dollars into the school, school system. I don't want it to be sort of the lame duck in the next session. Well, we did that already because we still haven't done enough. We have to keep up with the times. Yep. We have to keep up with inflation and keep up with student needs. And so I feel like we need a, a, a definite North Star and looking at what it costs to get our, all of our kids there. And well, Evan, yeah. I would just say this too. Yeah. 60% of the kids in the state of Texas are on free and reduced lunch. 60% of our kids. That's a remarkable difference in what's happened in the state. It's a great uh, win for our, our state that economically we're doing well, and um, I do love the fact we're a destination state and all that. Um, I just think we need to be a destination for all of our kids as well. A lot so. more work to be done. All right, give our panelists a big hand. Thank them very much. Thank you all. Thank you, ACC. Thank you. Always. Dr. Killian, thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ellis, thank you very much. Let me say briefly that Evan Smith is out the door with a car waiting for him to take him to an airplane so he couldn't stay to receive his award. But he, I did tell him, and he's very appreciative. I will be brief. Uh, I normally do a wrap-up, and this will be a little bit longer today. First of all, I want to thank all of our contributors and supporters, as we always do. Uh, without you all, uh, what the center does is not possible. Uh, your generosity and your backing, some of you for years, uh, has made possible the activities we do with our students. Uh, and we deeply appreciate your, your uh, contributions and your participation. And we appreciate you being here with us today and for the years in the past with some of you that you've consistently been with us. And I want everybody to give each other a hand for your, for your contributions and your part of being part of this activity. Uh, it's normally at this point that I say I will see you next year, but that's not true. Uh, this is my last year with the center. Uh, I will retire sometime this summer. So I want to indulge for a moment in saying thank you to a whole lot of people. First, I have to say thank you to all of you who have supported us. Uh, as I said, you would, this would not be possible without you. I want to say thank you to the students that have been part of the center's activity and the purpose for the center's uh, existence. Uh, we have a fantastic student body. Some of you have worked with our students and know what extraordinary people they are. Uh, they are, many of them, people for the first time in their family to go to college. They are veterans coming back uh, and trying to make something of their lives besides being soldiers, uh, both men and women, and they are wonderful, and working with them has been one of the... <coughs> one of the real honors of my life, and I will miss them desperately. Uh, I have served under two fantastic presidents, uh, Steve Kinslow, whose vision this center uh, was, uh, and gave me the chance to do this, and Dr. Richard Rhodes, who has supported our center and who has been my honor to work with. I've had uh, recently two fantastic people I've worked under, Dr. Molly Beth Malcolm, who is one of my oldest and best friends, and uh, um, Chris Cervini, who's been my direct supervisor and who comes from the same world I do of political consulting and has been a good friend and a good boss. Uh, I've had an outstanding board and I want to recognize the chairman of that board, Bruce Todd, who has helped me found this thing and has worked with me consistently to keep it going. Gerald Hill, Alan Kaplan, and my most recent board chairman, Rob Reyes, uh, who has worked with me for now several years and has helped me keep this thing afloat and financially and otherwise. I also need to thank uh, the faculty team who has worked with me and has made these projects that we have done uh, meaningful to the students and effective in keeping our vision going of promoting creative thinking and civic, uh, civic education and civic literacy. This includes David Lauterbach, Lynn Lytle, Jeff Millstone, uh, uh, 
Ed Mullen, who has run the internship program, which is a gold standard at this college. Mariano Diaz Miranda, who has worked with my oldest friend at the college, the first one I met, and Walter Prentice. These are extreme, extraordinary academics, and they are extraordinary leaders, and they are extraordinary vi visionaries. There is a list of campus managers who I cannot name all of them. Some of them are now retired, but who made their facilities available to us and made them places of learning and excitement for the students, and I will never forget them. I want to say thank you to all of you who have helped me. Many of the students are here, many aren't. Uh, people like Samantha Davis and Paul Theobald and many, many more who have come through this program and who I've been excited to see grow into outstanding young people and justify what we have done. And you all heard another one today in a manual. They have made the long hours and the dedication and everything else worth it. This, is, this center is important, it is unique in the community college systems in the United States and I look forward to seeing it continue. I have offered to work with it, but whether I do or not, it is something that this school should, cha should cherish and this city should cherish. And thank you for the opportunity to be part of it. Goodbye. <laughs>